Well, shall we begin? I'm to talk about applications of computers. Now, you probably already have understood that this course is a large number of anecdotes from my experience about how science and engineering runs. And in fact, that is what the course amounts to. It amounts to all the things I think you ought to know about, but is not taught in a normal course. This one begins with a story that about 50, mid 50, something like that, I discovered I was extremely nervous addressing large audiences. Now, I taught in college, so I was used to talking. But big audiences frightened me. Now, a function of a scientist is to communicate. There are written books and written articles. There are formal talks, and there are informal, quick talks. You should master all three. If you're going to create something, there is an obligation on your part to communicate. A large number of people don't do this. I felt the necessity, so I said I'd do something about it. Now let me first talk about the informal talks. I have quite a few of my friends at Bell Labs who are what I call backroom scientists. They're invited to a conference. We're going to make a decision about whether we're going to build it this way or that way. We make the decision, we go ahead. Two weeks later, they issue a memorandum about why we should have done something else. It would be desirable for them to stand at that moment and say, you are doing it wrong for these reasons, bing, 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 bing. This ability to talk at the drop of a hat and give a very good, clear explanation is very necessary in this age of group activities. When a committee is meeting or something, you have got to be able to speak up promptly and to the point and carry conviction. Now, the other ones were a little more troublesome, particularly the large speech. I said, well, you've got to do something about it, Hammond. You cannot become a great scientist if you cannot communicate well. It's one of the necessary things. So I said, I've got to learn. I've got to practice. I have to accept giving talks even though I don't like to. Well, shortly afterwards, I was asked from somebody from IBM if I would give a talk one night in New York to a group who were studying. Now, I knew what that was because what they normally do is they get a bunch of people, say, people who are learning a new machine or something, and they assemble them in New York. Monday night, they have a get-together party. Uh, Tuesday night, maybe they give them tickets to a theater. Thursday night, maybe they have a lecture or something. But they have a problem of entertaining the people for four nights in New York. And one of the things is this kind of a talk on computers. Well, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I wanted to give a talk so good that I'd be asked to give it again so I get more practice. Well, the first thing you think you're going to do in those circumstances is talk something you are very, very interested in and you are expert in. That's not the way to get invited again. <laughs> you had better start asking what is it they want to hear. Now, I'm not talking entertainment. I have a friend in computing who spent so much of his time being entertaining, he was gradually pushed out of the computing field. I am talking about communicating, but on topics other people want to hear. So I thought for a long while, now this is in the 50s, and I came up with the title, The History of Computing to the Year 2000. It was going to be interesting to me. Now, furthermore, I had the feature, which I point out to you. It meant that as years go on, and I gave the talk again and again and again, I had always to keep track of what was happening and look at what was the new things that might be possible. It kept me acutely aware of the future possibilities of computing. It kept my attention on that matter. It was just the kind of a thing I should do. And it's one of the things I want to summarize this point. When you give talks, when possible, you should profit by it also. It worked out very well. I gave the talk. They said it liked very well. And I said, well, I'll be glad to come in and do it again. And sure enough, I used to go in about three times a year for maybe six or eight years and give such talks. I got all the practice I wanted. But you see, it also did this other thing for me. When I use the expression frequently, luck favors the prepared mind, which is a remark of Pasteur and I believe in, you see, in some extent, I was making my luck. I thought what was wanted. <clears throat> now, the first time I gave the talk was on computers. I turned up, which is really the talk two times ago, except I had gorgeously prepared slides with 
curves for noise and curve for the uncertainty of quantum principles and such other things. Beautifully done. Very convincing. But you notice I didn't use them to you. I finally found out saying, come on, think about the size of molecules. Think about impurities. Think about how fast velocity light goes. Think about heat. And you see the nature of the problem without any elaborate quantum mechanical curves, which you probably didn't understand anyhow. I reduced it down to things you could understand. Well, I gave a talk a couple of times, and I began to realize that the future was not limited by the machines, it was limited by the software. So I started giving a talk on hardware and software. But after a while, I came to the realization that while not completely true, a great deal depends upon economics. What applications? That was going to control the development of machines. So I had to do this third talk. So the talk gradually moved from one to three different things. All because I said to myself, I have to learn to be able to give public talks. Well, now computer began as simple arithmetic. At Los Alamos, we were just grinding out numbers for atomic bomb design. Just numbers, 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 and it was only one letter. We named the designs by letters of the alphabet. So there was a letter P on the problems one all those cards involved with problem P. There was a Q on all those, but outside that it was all numbers. And this was generally how you think about it. But if you go back to something like 1300, there was a guy named Raymond Lull, or Lully, which is the way you want to spell it. He lived on Menorca. He was a Franciscan, I think. And he had the idea of building a logic machine. It's a screwy idea. Now, if you will read, uh, as you probably have, Swift's Gulliver's Travels, what you possibly don't know, that it's a tremendous parody on everything. The people who break their eggs at one end or the other were one of the political parties or the other part of the particle. The whole business of the island of Laputa is exactly a spoof on Lull. Raymond Lull's idea is that you could build a machine which would do thinking for you. So it does go very far back. 1300 was probably about the middle of his life. And it isn't the first time. On the other hand, we began by number crunching, pure and simple, because they were the only people who could afford the bill. Machines were expensive, and there was no other way of doing it. As machines became cheaper, we started doing other things. Now you see word processor. Now what, what I see a personal computer in somebody's office sitting idle. I cannot help but think, my God, if we'd had that back then, what computing I could have done with all that idle time. Machines have come so cheap, they're like telephones. They're idle most of the time, right? In the early days, no. My bosses used to want to know what fraction of time I was running. I was up sometimes to 97% efficiency throughout the week. And I argued with them, look, that's not the way to run computing. It's machine efficient, but human inefficient. I pointed at the telephone, and I got brushed off on that one, so I made another study. I studied men's johns. And I came to one conference and said, I made a study of men's johns, and there's always some capacity for somebody. I have never seen a john which there was not some capacity. You put in sufficient capacity so that people don't have to wait. Don't you think you do the same for computing? It's pretty much the same stuff. <laughs> they argued that it was a legal requirement, but I got the point across that it was foolish to have machines work close to maximum efficiency. It's tremendously inefficient for the humans. And we've gotten now down to the, almost the opposite. Personal computers operate a very low fraction of the time, and they sit idle waiting for you. So we got some progress there. And we shifted around. Now, I want to tell you another aspect of the problem which you will meet in varying forms. At Los Alamos, we were solving a large partial differential equation on relays. When I went to Bell Labs, one of the first problems I solved on the relay computers for Aberdeen was a big problem, partial differential equation, on design of relays. I actually solved a partial differential integral equation on our accounting department equipment. In short, I did very difficult problems on relay computers. When we got better computers, I was reduced to doing trajectories of guided missiles, trajectories to the moon, and such other things, which are ordinary differential equations and are much easier. 
Some years later, I wrote a couple papers on trajectories. Uh, I wrote a couple papers on just how to integrate. Then I wrote a paper on how do you evaluate a function. And finally, I wrote a classic paper on how do numbers actually combine. With the most difficult equipment, with, with the most primitive equipment, I was asked to do the most difficult jobs. At the back end, with the very advanced equipment, I was doing simple jobs. Now, this is what happens to any new idea. If you have a new idea which is going to influence your organization, you're going to have to demonstrate it will work under the most difficult conditions, the worst possible ones. When you finally get it installed, the bulk of the time will be spent on much simpler ones. But somehow or other, there's a very, very big impedance that people demand that you be able to do the worst, most difficult things first. Then you get around to do the ones you want to do or should be doing. I tell you this because on numerous occasions I've faced the thing and I've had to take action. You want to size up the opposition, and there are times when it's better to abandon the idea and go do something else. And I'll stick one more of those stories in along the way, uh, if I remember to do it, on exactly my doing that kind of a thing. Now, very early after I got started, I realized I was in the mass production of a variable product. That's exactly how I said it. I am trying to set up the situation so I can do all of next year's proposed problems. I don't know what they're going to be, but they're going to fall in certain categories. How do I do it? And I told you with a 650, I spent one man year, which was really several people working parallel for maybe four months, to get a software system going. Within a year, I had more work done than I ever would have gotten done if I'd gone at the problem straightforward. In short, it paid me to build a software tool. But beware, the machine 650 didn't stay around more than two and a half years before something else came along. If you try to build some software, you're going to get paid back for it. You'd better get those savings within a year or a year and a half, or you're likely not to get the savings. We are living in a changing time. These ideas don't last long. And so you've got to get your money on software. But it pays to build tools. Everybody knows it pays to take the time to build a tool. And building a software tool for the 650 greatly increased the amount of work I could do within one year. Now, I have ignored uh, way, much later in the lectures, I'll talk about one where I did a large business job for AT&T running a UNIVAC in New York City. So I will do so, but fundamentally I'm concerned with engineering problems. And what I observed, time versus the log the amount of operations, there was a curve research was bending over. Now, you've seen why curves bend over. There's a saturation point. Two reasons. One is that given a thousand scientists, just how many problems can they ask per day and still be scientists? There's a limit to how much they can ask. Now, they can ask for bigger problems, but the number of problems they can ask is quite limited. They can't absorb the answers. They can't think that much. So it curved went up and started bending over. But I spread out the work gradually to engineering. After all, as part of Bell Labs, and there's a whole Bell Labs engineering part, 90% was the engineering, 10% was research. So I found a load engineering coming up like this. And remembering this is logarithm, that's a great deal larger. And we have a military location at Whippany, New Jersey, which is devoted mainly to military problems in the past. I don't know what it's doing now. And they came along like that. Now, the result was that I saw the straight line growth. After that came word processing, which, as you know, occupies an enormous amount of time. Your compiler, when you use a Fortran compiler or your assembler, your monitor system are all re symbol manipulating things. They're not doing any scientific computing at all. They're just throwing symbols around. And I think we'll go on and find pattern recognition as a large consumer of computing. I don't think you can solve the general pattern recognition problem because it's too difficult. But a great many pattern recognition problems will probably be done by machine. And you also find that, say, virtual reality, which requires enormous amount of computing, will absorb a great deal of computing time, a great deal of computing power. So the curve is not over with. It's still going to go. But we are beginning to saturate von Neumann-type machines and having to go to parallel processing to do it.
Well, let me talk about another episode. Jack Kane. He was a guy at Bell Labs, and uh, he was crazy in the sense that I can prove he was crazy. A, uh, he was at one time more like that, and I get a letter from now and then, and I can prove to you he's crazy. But that's beside the point. He had an idea of connecting a new machine, a scientific data systems machine, to the cyclotron at Brookhaven, which we were using, to reduce data on the fly. Well, Jack was clearly crazy. And my vice president stopped me in the hall one day and said, look, he says, Kane thinks he can do these things. You know something about computers. Will you please investigate and tell me whether you think this can be done? Because it's a very novel idea, don't you? So I call up Jack, and we go to lunch frequently. And I begin to find out, yes, he's crazy, but he's got good ideas. And then I look at the machine, and I report back to vice president, yes. With some guidance from me, Jack Kane can do that job if you give him the machine. Then the vice president said to me, I don't want to get a machine from fly-by-night company. We'll be gone next week. Are those people likely to stay in business? That's not in my field of mathematics, mind you, but it's a question which he asks, I must answer, right? It happens that I know slightly the president. And so, having first studied the question, gone to IBM and asked a lot of pointed questions about their manufacturing and so on, and studied some books in economics, I make an appointment with Max Pilevsky saying, I would like to meet you out in your office at such and such a date about 10 o'clock. Uh, I want to talk about your company and we getting machine because there's some doubt that the company will be in business long. So I walk into his office, we are polite, and then I say to him pointedly, right out, the major cost for failures in this business is not enough capital. Have you got enough money? He laid it out beautifully. I asked him for other pointed questions. He again answers beautifully. We walked down the production line. I inspected it, having a look at IBM and some other ones, and it looked good. So I reported back, yep, we could. We got the machine. And with some guidance from me, Jack installed it, and by God, it was working great. Well, comes now another part. We are also using a band graph at Rutgers, which is pretty much the same AI particle accelerator, and we want to put a machine on that. Well, we had originally gotten the smallest machine which would do the job, and of course, when you get the smallest machine, we had had a lot of trouble making it work. I thought we would title some a better machine, and uh, this time it's in the matter of hands, not of the vice president, but in heads of a department head who's in charge of that kind of stuff. And I'm in his office one day, and I say, well, when are you going to make up your mind about getting a which machine? And he says to me, I'm going to decide what all the department is and agreed, which machine. I looked up at him and said, you mean you're going to settle for the stupidest mind of the bunch? And I walked out and never went back. Now, I had a lovely job at Bell Labs like that. Uh, I stuck myself, my nose into business, which wasn't needed, and I walked off. Now, sometimes my boss assigned me jobs, but fundamentally, I was in that position. And when I saw the opposition was that much, I walked off. I decided there were other things I could do which were more constructive than fighting a guy who wants to settle for the stupidest mind. Now, once we did these couple, we naturally wanted to put computers in Bell Labs to laboratory work, too. After all, these little small computers were just coming in, the personal computers, which were often kits you bought and assembled for yourself, but there were a few ones which you could buy already assembled. So we started doing this to reduce the data and the various experiments right on the fly, because my arithmetic suggested that the one at uh, Brookhaven probably doubled the capacity of the machine because when the data was reduced on the fly, you noticed that it wasn't quite enough counts. Oh, the damn sample must not be in the middle of the beam. We cut off the power, we go in, we adjust the thing, we come back out, we hang up the keys, we turn the juice on again, and sure enough. Or there's something funny happening at the end of that spectrum, we better get some more stuff up there, we go back, slightly change the experiment, and resume. We caught runs early that were going to be no good, whereas they used to run 18 hours and then look at the data. And of course, frequently, the 18 hours were wasted. That's how I think we doubled the capacity of the machine. Well, when we put these in Bell Labs, Bell Labs being electronic heavily, 
there has to be for an experiment a bunch of electrical stimuli and people quickly learned that if they put a digital analog thing on the end the machine could generate the input stimuli so we started doing that we'd put the stimuli into the stimulus you know, square sequence of square pulses or a square pulse followed, followed by a sinusoid we could put in these sim signals very easily but once you have the signals in and the data reducing out you're ready to close the loop and get a feedback system now you're in a position that's quite different. You can let the machine, while the experiment is being done, adjust itself for what you want. Now I tell this story because this is what happens with machines in the past. We got them for one reason. We promptly used them for other ones. The presence of the machine changed the job and we could respond with general purpose machines to the change situation. When you get special purpose machines, you cannot do that trick anywhere near as well. And I was greatly impressed at how many people got machines in and how that changed it. In fact, the whole psychology department finally got a glorious big machine in with a large number of terminals, and they only did interactive experiments, like shining a light on a person's eye to ball to watch how the iris grew, and then changing the signal, and watching the frequency which the eyeball could respond to or not, trying to probe what was the feedback mechanism in the brain that controlled these things? Because if you've got the frequency response, you have some idea, if it's a linear system, what the mechanism is, what the feedback paths are, and so on. We started doing a large number of these interactive experiments, and it proved to be very, very useful. The social science department was one of the most active. Now, I want to go on to something, another topic along the way. The same vice president asked me, asked me, yes. He said, uh, some people at Boeing, Seattle, are going to ask you to come out and spend two weeks looking at a computing center. It might be a nice thing if you went. Now, he didn't order me to go. He never did that. But I got the message, and so when they called up, I agreed. I was in for a surprise. I thought I was going out there, the guy who invited me, to inspect how well they were doing computing, uh, managing machines. Well, the first day, Monday, he's escorting me around. Suddenly, I am sidetracked by his vice president, separated from him, taken into a room, which a large vice president and some of the board of directors are there, and said, what we want to know is, is this guy doing a good job or not? Not how the computer there, but there. I gulped six times and thought about walking out, and I said, no, my vice president probably knew that was a job. He just didn't want to tell me in advance. So I'm probably doing the job he wants, so I guess I'll have to do it. Well, the first thing I found out was that Boeing kept a record of the current design of the airplane on a tape. Now you'd keep it on a disc. And the idea was very simple. We shall use that, and everybody will be compatible all the time. It didn't take me very long to find out that was not what happened. It cannot happen. Suppose you're in the wing design department. If you are trying to make small changes here, there, and yon to see if the flight is better, and if somebody over there changes something over there, you may see something better when your design, new design was worse, right? What you do is you make a copy of that tape, and you use that tape unchanged by anybody else until you get your design perfected, because you cannot do an optimization design if the constants you are using are constantly changing. No way. When they got it done, then they would try to integrate it with the rest of the plane. Now, I think the vice presidents thought that the tape was being used, but every group, in fact, did something quite different. They got a copy, latest one they could, they froze on that one until the finished optimization was done, and then it was integrated back in. You can see why it has to happen. Now, it brings up databases in general. Databases are a very, very difficult topic. Every damn big executive I've ever met, right, he felt that if only he had the complete state of the company at every moment, he could make better decisions. Well, let's ask the question, a brutal one. If the decision is going to depend upon moment-to-moment -moment data, is that a decision a president or a board of directors should make? They should be concerned with long-term effects, which should not depend upon moment-to-moment -moment situations. Right? 
Therefore, that idea that they have, that they can manage better, yes, they can micromanage better, but uh, they really should not be making important decisions based on moment to moment. Those decisions should be made at a lower level, by far. And in some companies, they finally were. So uh, the idea that you have a company database is not such a red hot idea as you might think. It doesn't get too well. Now, one other feature bad, suppose you and I are both vice presidents of a company, and there's going to be a meeting Monday morning, and so you go in Friday afternoon and run the programs to get the results. And you have the graphs showing what's going to happen. But I, knowing that a great, much, great deal of data comes in over the weekends, because telephone lines are cheaper then, I go in Sunday night using exactly the same programs, but a different database, and I come up with different conclusions. And we walk in the present, you have one set of curves, I have a set, another set. It is not tolerable. It is not a reasonable way to operate a company. So the idea that I can have a rapidly changing database and use it to make high level decisions is very, very dubious proposition. But what about scientific databases? So you have a scientific database and there's a velocity of light in it. And somebody in your organization makes a new measurement of velocity of light. He wants his in. There's going to be a great deal of wasted company time as to who gets whose velocity of light in the damned thing. Furthermore, if the velocity of light is changed and I'm making some studies, my program recalls for C shows a change. Not from what I'm doing from case to case, because somebody has changed the velocity of light. Again, I can't use, even in science, a constantly changing database if I want to optimize and do such studies, which is what we almost always are doing. So while it's a very nice idea, uh, it doesn't work out so well in practice. Now you can, all, of course, do what the Computing Center did at Bell Labs for a while. Every change you was set out, change notice to all the users. As a result, you got two or three change notices a day in software, this or that, the other thing. Well, you're busy working, you don't read the damn things. Now suddenly, when you use something new, it doesn't work. Ah, the center says, oh, we told you six weeks ago without that change. But you weren't paying attention to that, then you were fine to something else. Blaming the user for not paying attention does not decrease the wasted time of the company. It's no use trying to pin it down. You can see again that that kind of method isn't going to work if changes are made too rapidly. The user simply cannot keep up. Now I began by talking about general purpose machines, but I'm gradually talking about special purpose ones. Now one of the first times a general purpose machine was built, in a sense, was back Intel, what had Intel in the very early days of the greatest circus, had three or four different jobs. And somebody said, you know, if I built a four digit, four bit general purpose computer and programmed it, I could do all these four different problems by different programs. So I'll make one production line run of all of these and simply write the different programs and I'll be able to supply the chips for all four ones with only one production run instead of four. Well, it wasn't very long, but you knew four bits could be made eight because four bits computers are awful small. They went from eight for a while, 1632, and now you have 64 bit computers right on a chip, right? But it started when a guy had a bunch of special purpose ones and he backed off and said, I can do the whole bunch with one general purpose approach rather than special purpose all the time. Now you tend not to realize how many computers you operate with. Stop and go signs. In your car, even now, there are computers trying to regulate the mixture of gas and air and so on in your carburetor. There are various timing things and so on are being operated by computers. Your personal computer is. A vast number of things are being operated by computers. Washing machine, my wife's uh, dish dryer, dishwasher and dryer. It's got a small chip in there. We have them all over the place and you're going to see many, many more. The difficulty is, of course, that if the washing machine goes out, that chip has got to be replaced. It's got to be found from one place. It's not a general purpose chip generally, and it suffers from that case. It wouldn't cost the manufacturer much more at all to put in a general purpose chip instead. But the egotism, of I told you before, of a special purpose chip is very, very high, and I warn you extremely loudly against the dangers of special purpose chips. Now, 
Now, I don't have to tell you what the applications of computers are in your business. You ought to know it better than I do. But they're going to spread. And they're going to spread for the reasons I gave you at the end of one of the earlier lectures. Cheaper, faster, freedom from boredom. Also, if you've managed it all, you know the role of personal personnel problems. Well, computers don't have to have sick leave. They go to the repair shop if they have that. They don't have to go home because their grandmother died. They don't have to have pensions. They don't have to have recreation. They don't have to have all kinds of things that humans have to have. Therefore, you will see more and more done by machines. Now, a robot, in my estimation, is something which handles things in the material world. It doesn't have to have wheels or legs and arms, although it's, you may think that way early. It's anything that handles things in the material world, like picking up chips and turning them over. It's very, very hard for machines to cope with the real world. It's very hard to write programs for that. That's why I told you the other day, when in my youth we had screws and nuts and bolts to assemble things, now you have rivets and welding. Building a machine which will put a nut on a bolt is a disease you think. You just watch several times how when it gets stuck, what you do, and how you get a nut to go onto a bolt. Uh, you've decided you don't want to write that program after a while. It'll work on a lot of them, but it's got to work on every damn one. That's why we're at the other things. It's not too nice, but that's what we did. Now, the range of applications in your business probably is only beginning. In mine, science has gone a long way because that's where it started by and large. We have probably a better idea of our future than you have of yours, and our future is not very clear. The possibilities of machines are very, very large indeed. They're a very awkward topic. Now, when you leave your careers, I want you to look at where, what were the cases which succeeded in using computers and which ones didn't, and why didn't they? Because this is going to be a major problem you're going to face. Do we mechanize this or that? People will tell you, older officers, that it must be done this way. There must be a man with a gun doing this and so on and so on. It cannot be done by machine. Blah, 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 blah. My advice is if a person is too insistent, you walk off and go do something else. Almost all the past doctrine of how things must be done is not right. I told you the story when I suggested one out of ten experiments were done in the lab, on my machine, and nine out of ten in the lab, it would be reversed. Now out of ten would be in the my machine, one in the lab, the management knew I was wrong. I was a crazy, long-haired theoretician. I was dead right. They were wrong, and they spent an enormous amount of money because they could not understand that what was happening was we were changing the nature of science. And we're changing the nature of your business. The nature is being changed. But the older people cannot apparently absorb this. And so you as younger one, you have to be patient with these older people. After all, they know how they got to the top, and that must be the right way. It was the right way when they did it, but it isn't the right way now, and it won't be the right way tomorrow. So anything I can tell you how to succeed today will not be appropriate to your career tomorrow. You have to find that. But I guarantee you a large amount of machines will be coming into your business. Now, one of the things they are doing is I find very interesting. They are teaching us about ourselves. We are learning amazing about ourselves. For example, in programming, we are learning how little we know about language. There were very early proposals and attempts, lots of money spent, on translating Russian to English. We found out we don't know how language runs. We don't know how anything. For example, uh, I'm trying to get some ideas in your head. There's some meaning in what I'm talking about. I do not know the meaning of the word meaning. I don't think you do either. You know until I ask you. It's like I think I've told you the story. St. Augustine says, I know what time it is until you ask me, and then I don't know. I know what I mean by meaning until I ask. And then I found I don't know. And therefore, I cannot write a program which will deal with meaning. 
I can write programs that deal with symbols. I can do other things. But this elusive thing, meaning, I have the idea. You can't say what they mean. No way. When you get the idea finally of something, it is one molecule flips over this way. Now you got the idea. It isn't that simple. Whatever you mean by, oh, now I've got the idea. Now at lunch today, I was discussing my friend. I picked him, by the way, because he looks like an interesting person to have lunch with. He can think. We were talking about this point. I said, well, how do I measure whether the student has the idea in a calculus course of integration by parts? What I do is give him three or four problems and see if he solves them pretty much the way I would, in which case I say he's got the same idea. That's not proof, but that's the evidence we use, isn't it? So we think the other person has the idea or the understanding when under particular tests they seem to behave the same as we would. So we don't know what meaning is, but we have a way of coping with it which is not too good. Namely, I ask three or four questions on integration by parts, and the student either gets them or he doesn't. But that doesn't mean he understands that I've only got a sample of four out of hundreds of thousands possible. So it's a very difficult question. Now, the previous two ones, I talked a great deal about the future of the hardware, what the limitations were, and I talked a little bit about the future of software and the problems we're going to involve. Talk about the future of applications is a far, far more difficult thing, and it falls in the area, I believe, called artificial intelligence. What can machines do that we normally do and we'd like to have machines do? Now, in this field, which I'm taking up the next two lectures, in fact, the next three are devoted to that, uh, we're trying to find out the question of what machines can do for us. Now, many people have tried to get, when can machines replace us? Well, there are some jobs I would like to see replaced, which are physically very dangerous. But in general, I have always tried to concentrate on what can machi machine and man do together. It's not a question of what can machines do that we can't, or what can we do that machines can't. It is a basic problem, what can machines and us together do? That's the real problem. And so to do this, we have to look at what kind of things have been done in this area of thinking. A very glib way of studying the whole problem of AI, artificial intelligence, is can machines think? It's a very nice way of phrasing it. It isn't a total thing. Now, it's been evaded by some very good experts. Turing, when presented with a problem, said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll put at the end of a teletype a human being, and another one I'll put a computer. And if you, at your end, cannot tell one from the other, the machine must have been thinking. Well, that's not decent science. It's a very, very difficult task. And normally, science begins by doing the simplest problems. Thus, Galileo dropped simple things. In fact, he ran them down a slope slowly. He didn't drop them. He ran them down a slope like that, attenuating gravity, so he had better timing. Normally, science begins with something close to the simplest program or problem you can do and work your way up. Thus, in trying to approach artificial intelligence once, I started to ask myself at night, as I went to bed and put my head in the pillow, what would be the smallest program which I would consider thinking, such that if I cut it in half, neither piece would? Not what is the biggest program, but what is somewhere near the least that you will accept as thinking. After a year, which means probably 200 dice out of the year, I actually did start thinking about that until I fell asleep, I had no answer. There's one obvious thing to do, and that is say, huh, it must be the wrong question. I don't know. I leave it to you to think about for some time now. If you think machines can think, and you think you know what thinking is, what is something near the least that you regard as thinking, that you would accept? I may have told you, I, well, I guess it, I tend to get ahead of sometimes of these things. Uh, there are people who get around it by making strange definitions. The power of definitions is very, very great. The difficulty is, fundamentally is, 
you want a definition that you can think. And you don't want any question that can you think, because I can always raise the question, is there intelligent life on Earth? And you'd be hard put to prove it. But you don't want that definition. You want a definition, because of your ego, that you can think. Well, what is it that this is that you can think? And how small an activity, not how big a one, but how small a one, will you accept as thinking? That's one of the ways of approaching this field of artificial intelligence. It's a very, very vexing one. It is cursed by a large number of wild claims. Almost all the leaders in artificial intelligence have made wild claims. For example, probably in the early 50s, several very good men at RAND said, the chess champion of the world will be a computer within 10 years. Well, the chess champion of the world is still not a machine, but we are closing in on the matter, and it would be dangerous to assert that before the year 2000, machines will not be able to beat humans playing chess. They have certainly demonstrated a while back on backgammon. The parent story goes, I heard, that somebody's backgammon program took on all the people who came up, the leaders in a tournament in Italy, and beat them all flat. Games like Go, which is a Chinese game, popular, or Japan too, it's much harder to play. It's, the game is so simple that it's very, very hard, and there have not been very good successful programs there. But an amazing number, my friend wrote a good checker program, which I'll discuss next time, because checker was thought to be easier than chess. And we've looked at a problem, we've done a great many things, but we don't know yet. And the problem will not go away. If you believe machines can think and do anything at all, you are almost bound to fall on your face sometime or other. Like quite a few of my friends, back programs which are going to translate from one language to the other. They really are not viable to this day. You can have them do a little bit, but it doesn't work. And I can tell you simple reasons why. You might think that you're going to translate word for word. It works for a while. But consider the following conversation my wife and myself. I say to her, we're not going shopping today, are we, dear? She says, no, meaning, yes, we are not going. How will you ever recognize double no's meaning no or double no's meaning yes? I don't know any formula which will help you. Some situations go one way, some go another. And I might as well tell you the last one and quit. It's one of my favorite ones about my wife. We had a house in New Jersey with windows looking right out on the garden. We're having breakfast. And she says to me, Dick, it's raining out. I look at her and say, does that dumb dame think that I can't see this raining? What the hell goes on? I think some more. And I say to myself, what she really said was, I've had my second cup of coffee and I'm fit to talk to. Right? I was so enchanted with that discovery that much of the day I, well, at Bell Labs I spent in watching wherever I could, at lunch in the halls, casual conversation, how often what was said, if interpreted literally by a machine, was not what was being communicated. For example, you pass by all, how are you? They generally don't want to know. They don't want a long list of your aches and pains. It's something else. It's acknowledgement that the person exists and so on. It's a symbolic gesture of some other type. Our language is loaded with this stuff. Our whole social fabric is filled with symbolic things which mean something quite different than what they appear in words. And this is, makes it very, very difficult to cope with language as we speak it, when you want to get into machines. It sounds so nice, and so many people have started. Let's solve the whole problem by programming in natural language, and there won't be any trouble. The trouble with natural language doesn't work that way. What, however it works, the various theories we've had so far are all been shown to be very inadequate. They said we do not account for how we do it. And you, uh, many of you have children. You must have watched how children learn a language 
they sure didn't get explained nouns, verbs, or anything else like that, or any agreement, tense, or any of those things. We were never told them, and they learned to talk pretty well. Their chief error was being too regular. They spoke their ver the, the verbs and other things, so they spoke too regular. We had to point out to them, no, the plural of ox is not oxus, it's oxum. They tend to be somewhat more regular, but they somehow or other can learn a language knowing none. It's another thing, if I know a language, you're going to teach me another one. That's easy. You've got the first one, you can play the second one. But how a child not knowing anything learns baffles me. Because if I point to a horse and say horse, does the child think that's the name of the horse, like Charlie or Joe? Or does he think it's the name of a four-legged animal, a backboned animal? Does he think it's the color I'm pointing to? How can anyone ever get an abstract idea from the concrete. You can only see the concrete. How do you know what to abstract to get the abstract idea? How does that child know what to abstract and recognize? I'm talking about a class of horses, as you and I mean it. And you know as well as I do that every dictionary is circular. The first words define the other words, right? You can't start from nothing and get any place. Yet, it's clearly observable, children can learn, it's clearly observable that ideas are communicated from one person to another, though we don't know what we're talking about, while I'm walking into this very treacherous field of artificial intelligence, and we're going to work on it very slowly, but it's an extremely baffling thing because we don't know what we do, how we do it, anything of the kind. Yet, it's clear that there is somehow or other widespread mutual understanding based on a test I told you in calculus. I ask four questions. They seem to do as I would do. I conclude they have my idea. Do they have it? There's no way I can prove it, is there? So I see you, what, Friday at 3, right? Okay.